Hello and welcome to the Phoenix Basics series. This series will introduce you to the basic fundamentals of what you can do with Chaos Phoenix by conveying a high-level overview of the general principles, settings, workflows, and components of simulations. You can then apply this knowledge using our tutorials and example scenes, which walk you through how to create a variety of different content with Phoenix. Note that we will use a streamlined visualization of the user interface for this series in order to quickly focus in on specific parts of the UI and discuss basic parameters. Keep in mind that the Phoenix UI for 3ds Max and Maya are similar, but not exactly the same, so we'll try to flag any important differences. Alright, with that all in mind, let's get started! Chaos Phoenix is a dynamic simulator, which enables you to create fluids like liquids and gases, such as fire and smoke, that interact with the surrounding environment. For example, you can create liquids such as water, coffee, and honey, as well as fountains, vast oceans, and even lava. For fire and smoke, you can create effects like explosions, burning fuel, large-scale smoke such as from volcanoes, as well as dust, tornadoes, clouds, galactic nebulae, and more, all with Chaos Phoenix. Phoenix can also make a ship, or ice cubes, or other objects float in water and even simulate waves that can carry them around or wash them away, with its built-in support for rigid body dynamics using active bodies. If you want to jump right into creating a scene or doing something hands-on, you can get started with our existing quick start guides, which are set up with beginners in mind. You can also explore our templates and example scenes, though some of these demonstrate more advanced techniques that may not be suited for beginners. We also have a bunch of tutorial content that is classified for different skill levels, located in the tutorials rollout of our docs. These can give you a sense of the vast capabilities that Phoenix offers, and can help you to learn how to create a variety of different simulations. Note that Phoenix also comes with a handy toolbar that offers presets for common setups, such as a large-scale ocean simulation or gasoline explosion, as well as small-scale setups like coffee, beer, candles, and so forth. The presets offer base simulation settings that you can use right out of the box and analyze to see how they work. They also serve as a basic setup that you can then further customize and modify to fit your needs. First though, let's talk about the key ingredients and requirements for setting up a Phoenix simulation, as well as introduce you to the core concepts of simulating in general. After covering the basics, we'll then get into more detail about how Phoenix works under the hood, and introduce more advanced topics and features. This way, you will have a straightforward understanding of the fundamentals of simulating, and know how you can use Phoenix's powerful capabilities to achieve a wide variety of different effects and results. To get started, it's important to keep in mind that the workflow with Phoenix fluids and active bodies is split into two main parts, simulating and rendering. For example, the Phoenix simulator is represented as a single object for convenience, but internally, the simulator component and rendering component are two completely separate parts. Therefore, running a simulation and rendering can happen sequentially in that order, or they can also alternate or overlap. In general, running a simulation will produce an asset as a result, and then you can render that asset, much like modeling meshes or grooming hair. Let's take a closer look at the simulation aspect first and discuss the basics of what simulators do. You can think of a Phoenix simulator as a 3D box inside which simulations of fluids are performed. The box is divided into small cells, called voxels, which is why the box is referred to as a simulation grid. The voxels inside the grid can be filled with just about any type of gas or liquid. The word voxel is a contraction of the words volumetric and pixel. Pixels make up 2D images, but in 3D space they have volume, so voxels are basically pixels with volume. You can think of voxels as a structured array of tiny 3D cubes stacked right next to each other in a grid, to form the simulator volume. For each frame in your simulation, Phoenix looks at each voxel and calculates whether there is any fluid there based on the settings you give the Phoenix Sim. The simulator will also account for obstacles, such as geometry, as well as participating forces in the scene, and so forth. When you press Simulate, the activity of the fluid in all of the voxels is calculated in sequential steps, representing the passage of time. The number of steps can be modified in the simulator settings, and determines how time is subdivided. The order of steps is always sequential, meaning the simulator will always move sequentially from one step to the next, calculating fluid properties for every step. 
As the process is completed, the sequence will have mapped the evolution of the fluid across a chosen time interval. For example, when simulating an explosion, each step calculates how the smoke billows up into the air. Based on your simulator's settings and any other forces in the scene, the simulation would calculate if the smoke should rise up or fall down or blow in a certain direction and so forth. Similarly, for a liquid sim, each step would calculate, for example, wine pouring from a bottle into a glass and sloshing around inside the glass as it fills up until the glass is full or even overflows. Note that fluid simulations are entirely dependent on the previous simulated step, and so you cannot take a shortcut to simulate the last frame of a simulation without first simulating all of the frames that come before it one by one. This is unlike rendering, where you can typically render in any order or tell many machines to render a certain time segment. With simulations, you always need to simulate the steps in sequential order, one step at a time. However, if you stop a simulation or need to interrupt it before it is done, Phoenix offers a way to continue again at a later time using the Restore option. This is dependent on the backup interval parameter, which determines how often you can restore a simulation again from the most recently simulated backup frame. Note that each simulation grid has a set of parameters that governs the behavior of the fluids within its 3D space, as well as their interaction, or not, with geometry inside the grid. There are several different rollouts available, depending on the type of sim, which can affect either the simulation or the render. The simulation rollout contains the main controls for starting and stopping a simulation, as well as displays statistics such as simulation times and information about the data contained in the sim for the current frame. Meanwhile, the resimulation rollout lets you resimulate over an existing base simulation in order to enhance details or increase its resolution, as well as slow down or speed up the simulation. For liquid simulations in particular, you could also resimulate to add, delete, or modify particle systems. The grid rollout lets you set the boundaries, size, and resolution quality of the sim. Then, the dynamics rollout offers parameters to affect the fluid's behavior when simulating. For example, if you're simulating water pouring from a faucet, you can specify in the dynamic settings whether the water should respect gravity. If you tell the simulator that there is zero gravity, then the water will float around inside of the box instead of falling down or along the direction of the gravity vector. Note that in 3ds Max, there are two types of Phoenix simulators, fire smoke sims and liquid sims. In Maya, these are combined into one simulator. As a result, you will see some slight differences in the layout, namely that in Maya, there is a liquid rollout for controlling liquid settings, whereas in 3ds Max, the liquid settings are mainly controlled in the dynamics section of the liquid simulator. Meanwhile, the output rollout lets you manage where and how the simulated data will be saved. It also lets you set the backup interval parameter that we mentioned before, while the input rollout manages how the data is read and played back. The preview rollout lets you control how the sim is displayed in the viewport, and the render rollout affects how the sim looks when rendered. Note that changing the preview or the render settings will have no effect on the simulation itself, as they have separate controls, but the result of the simulation will of course affect what is previewed and rendered. Parameters that control the simulation are separated from those associated with shading and rendering, so no rollout will contain mixed parameters and no parameter will affect both the simulation and rendering. There is also the scene interaction rollout, where we can tell Phoenix which objects in the scene should and should not interact with the sim. There is also an export rollout for exporting meshes and particles to file formats like Alembic. In addition, there are specific rollouts intended for controlling certain types of simulation conditions. For example, there is a fuel rollout for the simulation of burning which is useful for creating gasoline explosions or propagating fire effects. When simulating liquids, there are additional rollouts for splash and foam to set the conditions for when splash particles and foam particles should be born for simulating effects like waterfalls, oceans, and so forth. Speaking of settings that are uniquely used for certain types of simulations, liquid simulations have peculiar properties that differ from those of fire and smoke simulations. To better serve these different needs, Phoenix simulators are divided into two types, fire smoke or liquids. Fire smoke simulators can produce gaseous effects like fire, smoke, and explosions 
as well as create sparks or embers. These types of simulations are grid-based, meaning they consist of voxels that contain the fluid's properties at a position and given time, such as the fluid's temperature, its velocity, its color, and so forth. These fluid properties are written inside what we call grid channels. Each channel stores a type of value, such as temperature, velocity, and so forth, with its own range of possible values that is most efficient for that specific channel type. Phoenix determines the fluid's behavior at a given time based on the content of these grid channels. Meanwhile, the situation is a bit different for liquid simulations, which can create pouring or flowing liquids or any simulation that needs foam or mist. Liquid simulations use a hybrid solution under the hood, which combines a grid simulator with particles in order to take advantage of the benefits of both. Generically speaking, particles can be used to create a variety of different effects in both 2D and 3D. Phoenix generates particles for liquids because they are useful for representing the characteristics and behavior of a fluid, and as a result, look more natural when rendering liquids, especially when generated in very large amounts. Liquid simulators generate particles that drive the simulation by writing simulation data inside each voxel's grid channels, so that the grid data is built from those particles. The particles emulate real-world fluids by moving through 3D space within the simulation grid, and unlike voxels, each particle carries its own fluid properties with it, and these properties can change every frame. Since Phoenix is also designed to be very flexible, fire smoke and liquid simulators can actually produce both grids and particles, which can be useful for certain effects. For example, there is an ink and water preset that is supposed to represent liquid. However, it actually uses a fire smoke simulator and creates particles, called drag particles, to achieve its effect. And, when a single simulator produces both grid and particles simultaneously, the renderer can interpret them in many different ways, making it possible to create some very diverse effects. Now, let's discuss a few other important Phoenix nodes that you'll frequently use when simulating. Note that the word node is just a generic term that is synonymous with a helper or component, and it is often used to describe different Phoenix components that have a specific function. Nodes may contain data or expose settings that make it possible to modify data. We'll cover many different Phoenix nodes, such as sources, particle shaders, and different Phoenix forces, as well as their functions and capabilities in the upcoming sections. On that note, in order to actually create a simulation, there are three different components that must always be combined, a simulator node, a source node, and an emitter. This is the minimum requirement for just about any simulation setup. The only exceptions are that for liquid simulations, you can simply fill up a simulator with liquid or tell Phoenix to fill up a specified geometry with liquid, removing the need for a source and emitter. Let's now take a look at what an emitter is first. An emitter is what actually emits the fluid inside of the simulation grid, and it can be geometry and or particles. Aside from the exceptions that I just mentioned a moment ago, you always need an emitter for a simulator to be filled with fluid. This is so that the simulator knows where in 3D space the fluid should be born. For geometry, the fluid can be emitted from the surface or from the entire volume of the emitting geometry. Meanwhile, Non-Phoenix particles, such as particle flow or tie flow, can emit from a spherical 3D shape or from instance geometry and act as emitters for a Phoenix source. Next, you need a source to tell the simulator which geometry or particles are emitters. There is a fire source that is used to emit fire, smoke, and drag particles into a sim. Meanwhile, there is also a liquid source that can be used to emit liquid particles, as well as other particle types like splashes and foam. Note that any geometry that is within a simulator's boundaries will by default be an obstacle to the fluid. And if any geometry or particles within the boundaries of a simulator are selected as an emitter in the source settings, they will also be an obstacle to the fluid by default, as well as interact with the simulator according to their source's settings. You can control whether an object acts as an obstacle in the sim by enabling or disabling the solid checkbox in the Phoenix property lister. Note that these default behaviors also apply if you have multiple simulators in the scene, as each simulator will interact with an emitter or geometry that is located inside that simulator by default. 
Keep in mind that the position of the source icon itself does not matter, because the source icon does not emit any fluid. Only the geometry or particles that you select in the source's settings can actually emit anything. The only exception is that the simulation grid itself can emit fluid when certain options are enabled as mentioned earlier. For example, when the initial fill option is enabled. The Phoenix source also contains its own parameters that affect the emission of the fluid, and these are separate from the simulator's own settings. The source settings can determine things like how much fluid is emitted and what exactly is emitted. For example, with a fire smoke source, you can emit a high temperature or fuel to ignite a fire or emit only smoke or emit only drag particles that are literally dragged along with the fluid. For example, Drag particles can be used to simulate effects like embers, wispy cigarette smoke, dust, or sand. In fact, it is worth noting that even if we do not simulate visible fluid like smoke or fire, there can also still be velocity simulated within the grid, which can affect drag particles and can also be previewed in the viewport or even rendered. Meanwhile, a liquid source can emit liquid particles to create a pool of water, as well as other particle types like foam and splash. For example, if you emit foam bubbles inside of a glass filled with liquid, you could simulate a carbonated beverage. There are additional options in the sources as well, such as the ability to emit an RGB color for the smoke or liquid particles, as well as the option to use textures as masks for the emission and create even more interesting emission behaviors. For example, you could use a black and white noise texture to make it so that the black parts of the texture will emit nothing, while the white parts emit smoke. This helps to break up the smoke a bit and can lead to a more varied or natural looking emission. Once more, note that if you have multiple simulators in the scene, a single source can emit into several simulators, since by default, all source nodes interact with every simulator, unless explicitly excluded. The source's own settings will be used for the emission, but because each of the simulators have their own independent settings, the behavior of the fluid emitted from the same source could end up dramatically different depending on the sim grid it is in. If you have a complex scene with multiple emitter objects and simulation grids, and you wish for only some of them to interact with the simulator, then you can use each simulator's interaction rollout to manage them. Here you'll be able to handpick which sources, geometry, forces, and simulators participate in a sim, or which should be excluded from that sim grid. Next, let's move on to discuss what happens to the fluid's data when you run a simulation. To recap, a simulator will run calculations based on its settings and produce raw simulation data that is saved onto your hard drive by default. When we press simulate, a Phoenix fluid sim will typically output an entire animation sequence. That sequence is saved as individual files called caches, which contain raw simulation data for each timeline frame. In essence, the cache data contains grids and particles, which describe the fluid's behavior. You can then send these cache files to your friends, who can load them and render the same simulation sequence on their own machine. Meanwhile, the viewport preview of the caches shows what the fluid is doing. The raw simulation data is displayed in a way that helps you make sense of whether the sim is going the way you envisioned or needs tweaking before you decide to start rendering. For example, if you run a liquid simulation, by default, you will see a particle preview in the viewport that you can play back in the timeline to see how the liquid behaves in the sim. You could also change the settings to view the liquid sim as a mesh instead of particles. With the particle preview, different types of particles, such as splash and foam, will display in different colors by default, making it easier to distinguish them. You could then enable or disable the preview of different particles in order to get a better sense of what is going on with your simulation without necessarily needing to render. Note that the viewport preview is also almost completely independent from rendering, and enables you to customize different aspects of the preview. For example, you could disable the preview of the splashes without affecting the visibility of the liquid particles, or the render settings. Meanwhile, the viewport can also display a voxel preview, which uses 2D triangles to emulate the shape of the volume. The voxel preview is typically used to display fire smoke simulations, and also allows you to specify which channels you want to see. For example, you could choose to preview only the temperature or smoke. You can also preview the simulation's velocity and see how Phoenix forces or standard 3ds Max forces affect the simulation. There is also the Phoenix GPU preview mode, which is a real-time detailed viewport preview 
for fire smoke simulations that shades the simulator directly inside the viewport. When enabled, it uses the volumetric render settings as a basis so that you can quickly preview their effect on the simulation's appearance without having to render. In fact, you can even use the GPU preview option as an extremely basic renderer and save out each viewport frame with shaded volumetrics. This can be a useful and fast way to do a previs of your sequence. However, note that the GPU preview is simpler and much faster than a production renderer, and as a result, there are some limitations as to how it displays volumes when geometries intersect the sim or are inside the grid. All right, let's do a quick recap before we dive into rendering. When we specify our simulation settings and run a sim, the sim is saved in cache files that we can preview. After this, we get to the rendering part, which has its own settings that are completely independent of the cache files. This is because sim caches contain only sim data and no actual render settings. For example, the render settings for shading a fire smoke simulation can be set in the Phoenix Simulator's render rollout. There you will find various render modes and volumetric options available for shading, but this information is not stored within the caches themselves. If you want to also save the Phoenix render settings for future use, there is a separate option to save and load Phoenix render presets as a .tpr file. Note that these render settings are simply for rendering and shading the Phoenix Simulator. They are independent of any general render settings for your scene. In order to actually render out your cache and get a pretty picture of your simulation, you'll need to use a separate renderer, such as V-Ray, with the only exception being if you're using the built-in GPU preview for a more simplistic render result. Regarding the options for rendering with Phoenix, simulation cache data can be rendered as either meshes, volumetrics, or as particles such as points and bubbles, based on the render mode you select in the render rollout or in the particle shader when rendering particles. For context, when the liquid simulator saves its caches, the liquid particles get turned into grids. Then, when rendering, the liquid grid gets rendered as a mesh. Meanwhile, fire smoke sims are rendered as volumetrics. However, Phoenix also offers a lot of flexibility in terms of how you choose to render your caches. For example, you could render liquid particle simulations as grids, meaning you could render liquids as fire, or smoke, or even particles, as well as render fire as a liquid. We'll go into further detail about the different render modes and what you can use them for later on. Regarding rendering liquid meshes, you would typically shade the liquid using a material. For example, you could use a V-Ray material that is set to be refractive and look like water. For fire smoke simulations, you can use Phoenix's built-in shading tools in the volumetric options panel. Here you'll have options for controlling the color and opacity of fire and smoke. There are different modes for shading the fire, which allow you to emulate the physical laws of nature, essentially linking the fire and smoke opacity shading together, or you can separate the controls for shading the fire and smoke for additional flexibility and control. The Phoenix Fire and Smoke Shader controls are designed to be straightforward and easy to use by giving you simple color gradients and graph diagrams that you can tweak using curves, which also give enough flexibility to achieve a wide variety of different results. For example, if you need more advanced controls, like the ability to multiply the data with textures or mix a few grid channels, you can do that with the available options in Phoenix as well. This customizability is useful because it allows you to shade a variety of different types of fire, smoke, and other volumetric scenarios, from candle flames to fireplaces, cigarette smoke to massive explosions, as well as sandstorms or tornadoes, or sci-fi content such as nebulae, or other effects entirely up to your imagination. All right, now you've been introduced to what you can do with Chaos Phoenix, as well as many of the major parts and components of a Phoenix simulation. In the upcoming Basics Part 2 video, We'll dive further into how Phoenix works under the hood while discussing the role of grid channels, particles, and particle channels. We'll also discuss some important components of a Phoenix simulation, such as the particle shader, before turning our attention to Phoenix forces and textures. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you for the next part.